grace and peace. You're listening to United We Pray. Taking racial struggles to the throne of grace, United We Pray is a ministry devoted to prayer about racial strife, especially between Christians. We want to help Christians pray and think about race in ways that are biblical and helpful, clear and hopeful. You can learn more about our work at youwepray.com. That's U-W-E-P-R-A-Y.com, where you can find articles, previous episodes, and more. Grace and peace, and welcome to this episode of United We Pray. My name is Isaac Adams, and I'm sitting here in Birmingham, Alabama, with Reverend Arthur Price, who serves as a senior pastor here at 16th Street Baptist Church, where he has served since 2002. Reverend Price is a graduate of Colgate Rochester Divinity School, where he received his Master of Divinity degree with an emphasis in biblical studies. Uh, You did your undergraduate studies at Temple University in Philadelphia, uh, where you received a BA in criminal justice. Uh, Reverend Price has experience as a prosecution assistant for a total of 11 years in both the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office and the Monroe County District Attorney's Office in Rochester, New York. Reverend Price, uh, I've had the privilege of getting to know you and be in uh, network with you, eat with you, sit under your preaching. Uh, So thank you for your ministry to our city uh, and to me, brother, and for joining me today. Thanks for having me today. Uh, We're doing a live show before a group of young African-American pastors, and here's where I'd like to simply begin. Uh, This is one of the most famous churches in the country, if not beyond our borders, because of what happened here on September 15th, 1963, with the bombing that tragically took the lives of four young girls named Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, and Cynthia Wesley. Uh, And brother, before I go even any further, can I just ask, as a Christian African-American man who's so deeply interwoven into this church, How do you reckon with the injustice of that tragic day? You have a a background in criminal justice. You have your Bible and your faith in Christ. At the time of this recording, uh, we recently commemorated the 61st anniversary of the bombing. How do you reckon with the injustice of that day? Well, the way I reckon with the injustice is basically is that um, sinners will do what sinners do. That's sin. Um, My problem is is when saints sin more than the sinners, that, that becomes a problem. Um, although some of them f- called themselves saints, it, it becomes problematic because um, if you think because I'm different, I'm deficient, then that's an issue. Hmm. Um, Jesus, um, on one occasion, when he saw some other disciples um, um, sharing the gospel, the disciples said, um, rain down fire on them. Hmm. And Jesus said, just because they're not with us don't mean they're against us. That's right. Just because they're different don't make them deficient. Hmm. So once we learn that being different don't make us deficient, um, I think that's a great lesson to learn. Um, but ultimately, I know that God is the righteous judge, and hmm. um, he will repay, and he will um, cast vengeance, whatever that is, that he is a righteous and a just God, and we put our faith put our faith in him. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for sharing that. It, just, it seemed fitting to give space to lament that tragic day right at the beginning. Uh, Brother, if I can ask, what is it like to pastor a church with such a legacy and painful history? Okay. Probably, believe it or not, like pastor most churches um, because churches are made up of people. Mm. People have problems. Mm. Um, Just because it's a historic church don't mean it doesn't have people and don't have problems. So um, we're ministering to the pain and the problems of people and trying to make sure that um, we're on a trajectory where they are becoming disciples of Jesus Christ, discerning the Word of God, and being developed in the Word of God. Um, the, the legacy piece that probably makes it a little bit more difficult than it does other churches is um, how to compartmentalize um, the history piece um, with the ministry piece. But one of the things we learned early on is not to run away from the history piece, but embrace it mm-hmm. and use it as a teaching tool on how God continues to bless us in spite of um, what, we, um, what the world thinks we've become. Amen. Amen. Can you tell us, I want to I circle back to that in a minute uh, about how you all have embraced the history as opposed to running away from it. Um, but can you tell us about the Sunday school lesson on September 15th, 1963, and how you see God's hand in that? Sunday school lesson that day was the love that forgives, talking about um, Joseph and his brothers, Joseph um, being thrown in the pit, um, being sold into slavery to Potiphar, um, being lied on by Potiphar's wife and placed in the prison, then being elevated to the, to the palace. Famine comes to the land. His brothers now, who had thrown him in the pit, um, comes to meet him, and they don't recognize him, but 
finally Joseph, um, after the little cat and mouse game that he plays with them, he says, um, what you did to me, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So when we talk about that day of September 15th, what the perpetrators did on that day, they meant for evil. They meant to keep the country divided. They, they meant to keep the race wars going, but God used it for a catalyst of change um, by getting the 64 Civil Rights Act and the 65 Voting Rights Act passed to galvanize that particular generation to motivate a movement within the city of Birmingham and across the country and to make the bitter days of Birmingham even better um, because people um, recognize and realize that um, only, as Dr. King said, only um, love can drive out hate. Hate cannot drive out hate. Amen. Amen. The bitter days better. I like that. Uh, So, Reverend Price, I remember when we were eating lunch a few months ago uh, and you told me about when you were candidating to be this church's pastor. One thing that you mentioned in that is that while you only want to honor the legacy of this church as incredibly important, you didn't want to be enamored with that history. Uh, You said that this church is a ministry, not a museum. And that you wanted to prioritize not the history of the church, but the but the mission of the church. And I wondered if you could flesh that out and talk about why it's important in ministry to keep the main things the main things. Because um, I think when God calls us to ministry, and, and, and what people forget about 16th Street is that 16th Street is not 61 years old. It's 151 years old. It started in 1873. And... They started the church not to become a national historic landmark, but they started the church so they could be um, affirmed and where they could learn and live out their faith in Jesus Christ. So the main, keep the main thing, the main thing is important because people, when they come to church, um, again, they have problems, they have pains, they have pressures in life. And only the gospel, in my opinion, um, can address those issues. And people are looking for answers for the issues they have in life. And we try to do it through a Bible-centric ministry, through Bible-centric teaching to help them navigate through the problems, the pressure, pressures and pain through life. Mm-hmm. So if we were just a, another civic organization who do good things, then we would just be another civic organization. God did not call us to do good things. God called us to do good works. Mm-hmm. Um, Ephesians 2 lets us know that we are called um, and been fashioned to do good works. Other civic organizations do good things, but I believe the church does good works, and we can only do that by being um, obedient to the commission and call of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You bet, So you mentioned Bible-centric ministry, and uh, when it comes to keeping the main things the main things, uh, yeah, I just remember you sharing when you were candidating that that was some of your vision for the church. You wanted a Bible-centered ministry which exalts the Savior. I'm curious, how was that received um, at the time? Yeah, and, yeah, you know, most churches, when you say, we come, we come and we're bringing the Bible. Amen, Reverend, we want the Bible. Okay, um, but what does that look like? Well, for, for, for the vision that God gave me, that looks like we're going to be about evangelizing the sinner, okay? That means getting out from the four walls and making an impact in the community around us and evangelizing the sinner to let them know about Jesus Christ. We're going to exalt the Savior. That means we're going to lift the name of Jesus Christ up high each and every Sunday, each and every time we open the doors of our church, his name is to be exalted. Not the 16th Street Baptist Church, not the four little girls, not Pastor Price, but the name of Jesus Christ is to be exalted. We're going to equip the saints. That means we're going to um, institute classes where you can learn your spiritual gift. You can learn where what, what you have a passion for, what you have a heart for, so that you can be involved, engaged in ministry, because we want people to be involved in the ministry. We want people to be um, invested in the ministry. We want people to become instructed um, through the ministry so so they can go out and make a difference um, for the ministry of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, as we speak of exalting Christ, brother, I remember you sharing a word uh, from the old timers when it came to evaluating the preaching of young men who perhaps didn't, who perhaps struggled to preach Christ crucified. Uh, and you quoted the older saints who would say, yeah, he did all right, but you got to stop by Calvary. And I wonder if you can talk about why it is important to stop by Calvary when it comes to exalting Christ. Yeah, I think the story I shared, as a young preacher, I was preaching, and I thought that um, stopping by Calvary saying um, he was hung high, stretched high, he died, he died, he got up, was the lazy way of closing the sermon, that the preacher didn't have a more 
of an imagination to close the sermon. That's, that's the only way you can close the sermon. So I remember preaching and an older preacher said, yeah, he, you did all right, but you forgot to stop by Calvary. Mm -hmm. And the reason why stopping by Calvary is so important is because we come here every Sunday to tell the same story, mm -hmm. that he died, he was buried, he rose, and he's coming back. Amen. Amen. That's the gospel. Amen. All right, we've talked about racial history. We've talked about the Bible and exalting Christ. Uh, this is United We Pray, so I would love to talk about prayer and then pray with you. Uh, brother, when I last came and worshiped uh, with the saints here at 16th Street uh, on a Sunday, we sang an old song that said, Jesus took the time, had me on his mind. I'm so glad he prayed for me. I've heard you just recently preach on Luke 22, where Jesus is talking to Simon, Simon, and he says, Satan wants to sift you but I've prayed for you. So before we talk about praying to God, can you just reflect on the wonder of Jesus's intercessory ministry, the wonder of him praying for us? Yeah, some people think prayer is like an um, untested vaccine, but prayer actually works. Uh, <laughs> uh, so one, one of the things- That was my next question. I have that quote right here. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> so I'm glad we're there. Yeah, yeah. So when people say, all I can do is pray, you're in a good space because prayer is effective. The Bible says the effective, fervent prayers of the righteous avail much. If my people are called by my name, humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then should I hear from heaven and I will heal their land. So prayer is a tool that we have that works. Prayer is a discipline that many Christians don't understand and don't develop. Just as, just as a musician or a um, concert pianist has to spend hours and hours perfecting their craft by practicing on that piano so they can be at their best. I believe a Christian ought to always be able to practice the discipline of prayer, that prayer is a part of our lifestyle. Prayer is not something that we go to as a last resort. Prayer becomes a part of us, um, that we that we ought to seek God out in prayer. But knowing that Jesus prayed for us and his intercessory prayer ministry for us is important is because sometimes we do not know what to pray for. Mm. Sometimes our prayers are self-centered. Mm. Sometimes our prayers are self-serving. Mm. But Jesus can take those self-centered and self-serving prayers and say, you know what? they say saying this, Lord, but what they really need is this. What they really need is that. And I thank God that he intercedes on my behalf because there have been times when I just prayed a prayer that was self-serving, that was um, only interested for myself, but I thank God that Jesus took that prayer and said, you know what, this is what he actually needs. And the prayer actually worked out for my benefit. Amen. Amen. Well, brother, let's, let's not just talk about prayer. Let's be about it. I would love for you to pray. You could take anything uh, we've talked about this morning, anything we've talked about here. Uh, would you just pray for us? And then I can close this in prayer briefly. Sure, let's pray. Father God, we're grateful and thankful for the ministry of prayer. Thank you that you taught your disciples how to pray. And thank you, O God, for instilling in us a need to pray to you. And we're so grateful that you are praying for us, that you are the one that is always making intercession for us. You're the one always knowing what we stand in need of. You're the one that um, leads us and guides us each and every day. So we pray right now, God, for these for these pastors who um, are in ministry, and we know that the devil is trying to take them out of the game, but we're so grateful and thankful that you have already interceded on their behalf. And the same way you've interceded on the behalf of the disciples, you have already interceded on their behalf, and we are we're grateful for the great things that you're going to produce out of their lives and out of their ministry. So, Lord, we love you. We adore you. We magnify your wonderful and almighty name. It's in your name we do pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Father, we do praise you for the Lord Jesus who has interceded for us and still does. And, Lord, I thank you for the reality, Lord, um, that though Satan demands to have us, our master, our Lord, our brother, our savior and friend has prayed for us. And we root our great hope and our confidence, not in our strength, uh, not in our ability to withstand, but in the fact that Jesus is with us and for us and does so by even speaking on our behalf for us in prayer. 
We thank you for the ministry of 16th Street Baptist Church. Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless it. Uh, Lord, we thank you for not just what happened in the last 61 years, but from the day uh, this church began, Lord. And we pray that it would continue to exalt the Savior uh, highly, uh, that all men might come unto you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Fellas, real quick, three last things real quick. One, can we just thank Dr. Pri uh, Reverend Price? Thank you for listening to this episode of United We Pray. You can find more information about our work at uwepray.com. That's U-W-E-P-R-A-Y.com. United We Pray is a donor-supported ministry, and if you are interested in supporting our work, you can find out more information on the website.